All right. Hello, and welcome back to another day of online learning. Uh, I am Principal Mr. Roll over here, and we have Mr. Levi and Miss Nikki. And I know that we all look like we're getting ready to rob a bank today, but we are, <laughs> we are doing the right thing, and uh, we're trying to keep our good social distance and wear a mask like all the, uh, the health agencies want us to. So hopefully you can still hear us okay. Uh, Mr. Levi? We got your guys' stuff all packed up and ready for you to come get it. Anything not picked up by July will be donated to Goodwill. We're here from 10 to 3 every day. Please make sure that you have all the way through week 9 finished. By this weekend, report cards are coming out in the beginning of June. Excellent. All right, so that's it for our announcements for this morning. Uh, let's go ahead and everybody stand wherever you are. If you're in your living room, in your bedroom or whatever, go ahead and stand at attention. If you're wearing a hat like me, please take it off. Place your right hand over your heart and let's say the Pledge of Allegiance together. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we hope you have a fantastic day of online learning, and we look forward to seeing you so you can come and get your stuff. <laughs> All right, take care, everybody. Goodbye. Bye, guys. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think we're about ready to start here. So uh, we're in week nine, day number five. As we explained yesterday, there's not going to be any homework today because uh, week four, uh, week nine, day four dropped a day late. And so because this is the last week of graded work, I'm giving you uh, today with no homework. So please just watch the lesson and follow along, you know. Um, so before we get to our introduction, I wanted to give an announcement for eighth graders. Um, we're still working on putting together the in-person graduation for July guys and gals. Um, the problem is that everybody we've reached out to so far has told us that they cannot commit to renting us their property and, and uh, giving us a signed contract. So the way this works is whenever we, uh, whenever we lease a building or a venue to do something that's off-site, like off-school property, there's always two steps. We have to, one, get the lease contract. That's an actual thing I have to sign. And then two, we have to get uh, uh, insurance in place for that facility. And so uh, we're having trouble because the facilities that would normally rent to us, uh, they, they won't because of COVID-19 because they're not sure that they can get the insurance coverage and da da da. You know, like the concern is what if somebody came to your graduation and they got sick? right and then they sued they could sue the venue uh, for allowing us to do it there and so on monday superintendent hoffman she runs all the education in this in the state uh, arizona uh, she'll be making a announcement uh, concerning what schools are and are not allowed to do uh, for reopening and for summer school and so after she makes that announcement if the announcement is positive, we, we might be able to even rent the gym over at Compass High School, uh, if, 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 um, if it's good news. Compass High School just did their graduation for their seniors, and they had to do a driving graduation, and the Pima County Health Department was actually there with the police officers ready to shut them down if they didn't do social distancing the right way, and they almost got shut down. Um, and so it was like a real serious thing. So um, we, we just need to be really careful right now and a little bit patient. So I apologize for all of you who are waiting for more news about the graduation. Um, but hopefully maybe a Monday or Tuesday of next week, so that'd be, if you're counting by our days, it'd be like week 10, day one, or week 10, day two, uh, we'll, we'll be able to give you more info. <clears throat> all right, so uh, let's get into our agenda for the day. So for life skills here, uh, today we're going to talk about college track roadmap. Again, we talked about options yesterday on why even if you don't think that you want to go to college at this time, it's still good to be on this track. And so we're going to start talking about that today. Uh, and so uh, then in uh, uh, economics and current events, we're talking about supply chain management as a career and why it's important to understand supply chains for your future. Uh, in history, we're taking a break today. We're not doing any new history. Um, 
In literature, we are going over chapter 30, and in fact, let me change this here. Um, I'm just going to say for literature today, I just want you to listen. That's it. Um, and then in science, we don't have any science today. We just want you to get the work done from yesterday, so it's a pretty light day today. right? And then for math, groups one and two, you're going to be combined. We're doing a lesson slash review on scientific notation. Uh, it's brand new for those of you who've never done scientific notation, and for those of you who have, it's a review. So uh, we're going to be doing that today. So again, today's a pretty light day, pretty, pretty easy going. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and jump into life skills. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we're ready to begin life skills. So today we're going to be uh, reviewing, because we talked about this a bit at the beginning of the year um, in the first trimester, but uh, high school college track. And so if you missed the video yesterday, even if you're not interested in going to university right now, you should still be interested in keeping your options open. And so if you follow this guidance that I give you today, you will keep your options open for anything that you want to do post high school. So I've broken it down into several different columns here. And so we're going to have your freshman year, sophomore year, your junior year, and your senior year. So we're talking about every year, what are kind of some of the things that you need to be doing, some of the things that need to be on your radar that you need to be thinking about and working towards in order to be successful in whatever it is that you want to do. So first up, in your freshman year, it's pretty straightforward. Um, no, whoops. Sorry, that's uh, another lesson I'm working on. In your freshman year, um, really, it's all about getting comfortable. So um, focus on GPA, and you want to do a 3.0 plus. So you want to make sure that you're getting a GPA of 3.0 or more, OK? I know this sounds silly, but try to make friends. That might sound dumb. But really, it's, it's your freshman year. You're new in high school. Try to make some good friends, OK? Um, start extracurriculars. So guys, um, guys and gals, colleges, universities, and post high school programs are not just interested in GPA. They want people who have good GPAs and people who are involved in their community. And so you want to start doing extracurriculars like your band. We talked about extracurriculars the other day, uh, you know, different clubs. Volunteer a little. Volunteer a little. Don't volunteer too much. It's your freshman year. You are just getting started and you need to focus on that GPA. GPA comes first. It's not a mistake that I wrote that first. Your GPA comes first and then everything else is after that. So this really is an order of importance for your freshman year. GPA comes first. Try to make some good friends, all right? Uh, do extracurriculars and then volunteer a little. If, if your family goes to like, a, like a, a church or a mosque or a synagogue or whatever, you can, you can just volunteer there just, just so you have something. Uh, again, you don't need much, all right? And so really your freshman year, that's all you're doing. And then at the end of the freshman year, try, try to set yourself up to take advanced courses uh, in the years to come. Okay? You're probably not going to be taking college level courses your freshman year. I mean, maybe some of you go into like UHS or basis, right? But, but you're probably not going to be taking college courses your freshman year. So start setting yourself up to get into those courses in the future. Okay? Now, in your sophomore year, try to take at least one weighted class. So you should be working towards that, at least one. Try, try to get at least one way to class in your sophomore year. Next, consider taking the PSAT. So the PSAT is the preparatory SAT uh, for, for getting into college. And so consider taking that your sophomore year. Um, you can take it sophomore year. You definitely need to take it your junior year. But you can think about taking it your sophomore year. It's not a bad idea when you're a sophomore to do that. OK, um, also <clears throat> continue uh, focusing on keeping 
GPA 3 or higher, 3.0 plus. Okay, can you continue focusing? Here, let me make this a little smaller so it takes up less space on the screen. There you go. Continue focusing on keeping your GPA higher than 3. Um, so again, you want a B and A average, an AB average, really. Um, if you get a C, which happens to everybody, you know, uh, it, and so if you get a C, you want to kind of correct it with two or three A's. Remember, we talked about choosing easy classes that are extracurricular, like a baking class or driver's ed or something like that. Or you can do art classes. Art classes are a great way to keep, uh, you know, easy A's in your in your circulation. So try to keep that that 3.0 up. And so um, let's see here, uh, volunteer. You know, you want to keep on volunteering and then uh, continue doing some kind of extracurricular. Again, uh, these programs are looking for interesting people, not just brainiacs. It's, it's a fact. Okay, and so in your junior year, this is when we start doing other things. So this is when it starts becoming a little more. So freshman and sophomore year, you're just focusing on getting decent grades, fitting in socially, finding a fun extracurricular that you can do after school with your friends, and maybe doing just a little bit of volunteering in both those years. So junior year, it's time to get real. So most of you will be 16 or 17 in your junior year, and it's time to start thinking about the rest of your life this year. And so if you've done everything that I suggested in freshman and sophomore year, you're going to be set up really well. Again, all of your options are going to be open coming into your junior year. Okay. And so junior year, first and foremost, take the PSAT. Take the PSAT. Don't not take it. Definitely take it. Okay. Next, apply for the National Merit Scholarship. There are a few of you listening to this uh, who are in the eighth grade today that might be candidates for a National Merit Scholarship. The National Merit Scholarship program is based off of your PSAT score your junior year. It cannot be based off your sophomore score. It's only based off your junior year score. You do need to get a pretty high national or PSAT score to qualify. But if you qualify for the National Merit Scholarship, um, it opens up three different categories of scholarships for you. It opens up the National Merit Prize, which is $2,500. So you just get $2,500 to help you pay for the school of your choice. Um, it opens you up, so that's the National Merit Scholarship Prize, if you become a National Merit Scholar. All right, so you're, you qualify for that. You qualify for business scholarships. So different businesses will do scholarship programs, like for instance, Facebook might sponsor a scholarship for young computer programmers. Um, you know, a Boeing might sponsor a scholarship for engineering students, okay? So you qualify for all of those business-based National Merit Scholarships in addition to the $2,500 one, and you actually qualify for other government scholarships if you get in that National Merit Scholarship program your junior year. So that can really help you out. Um, and so, so definitely, definitely, definitely do that, okay? Another thing that you can look into is starting in your junior year, if you're interested in the military, you can talk to a military recruiter. So this, this might be something you want to do. Again, this, I would say this is optional if you are interested in the military, okay? If you are interested in the military, you want to take something called the ASVAB. This is optional as well. Uh, again, this is if you're interested in the military, okay? So you want to take the ASVAB. Whoops, let me write that down. Uh, let's see here. Um, let me put this in the bigger box. Take the ASVAB, okay, military test. Tell the recruiter where you want to go, okay? And again, this is optional for anybody interested in military, okay? Um, right here, I'm going to say consider JROTC. So JROTC, ROTC, I don't even remember what it stands for, but J is the junior, 
So it's the Junior ROTC, and ROTC is a program for people who are interested in a military career. Now, you might be thinking that's not you, and that's okay. It wasn't me either. But ROTC offers all kinds of benefits. Number one, if you do JROTC, you can start doing it uh, uh, your junior year when you talk to a recruiter, okay? And uh, they do lots of fun activities. They do campouts. They do uh, rifle training. You get to, like, learn how to shoot a gun and take care of a rifle. They do color guard, where you learn uh, how to twirl around flags and the proper way to present an American flag. And, and you get to participate in ceremonies and stuff like that. Um, and everything is free. When you do JROTC, they pay for everything for you. So when you do weapons training, they pay for the weapons. When uh, you have to dress out in a uniform, they pay for the uniform. And so you get all the stuff for free. And the nice thing about JROTC is there is actually no, um, there's no obligation to join the military. You can do JROTC as an extracurricular activity. Everything is paid for by the military. And you don't have to join the military when you're done. You can just do it to see if it's something you're interested in. Okay? So anybody who's even thinking a little bit about a military option, uh, you know, junior year is the year to get that done. And if, if you've done well your freshman and sophomore year, uh, they take that into account, and you have to take the ASVAB, okay? In order to join the military, you must graduate high school. And if you graduate high school and you get good grades and you do well on your ASVAB, you have many more options in the military. You can literally pick whatever branch of service that you want to go into, and you can pick where you want to be stationed. So back in the day, I know people today who are adults who did well in the ASVAB and other things like that, and they chose to be stationed in Hawaii, okay? That's an actual thing that happens. Hawaii is so expensive to live there, but if you're in the military, the military pays for all of it. It is super sweet. Also, people who are part of JROTC go on to do ROTC in college, and they get most of their college paid for by the military. And so um, in order to do that, in order to get your college paid for by the military, you have to commit to work for the military after you graduate college. So I know I'm getting off track a little bit. If you join the military out of high school, uh, you are just an enlisted man or enlisted woman. You're an enlisted person and you're at the very bottom of the totem pole. You are, uh, you are the, <laughs> you're, you're, you're the absolutely least important person. If you graduate college with a four-year bachelor's degree, though, and you join the military, you get uh, you join the military not as an enlisted man or enlisted woman. You join the military as an officer, and the officers command the enlisted people, and the officers get paid sometimes twice as much as the enlisted people. And so by joining JROTC in high school, you can then transition into ROTC in college, get your college paid for, and have a guaranteed job waiting for you at the end of your college career. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And the, the big drawback, though, is that um, your life is planned. You have four years of college and then at least three years in the military. That's seven years of your life. However, you will have a college degree when you're done with that seven years, and you'll be making really good money. And so even for those of you who haven't considered the military in the past, this is a very interesting career choice that you should consider, okay? Uh, so junior year is when all of that begins, okay? Now for all of you who are not considering the military, that's A-OK, -okay, but I want you to know that it exists. When I was your age, no one ever told me that this existed. All right, last but certainly not least, okay? During the summer, of junior year, research and apply for college scholarships. So college scholarships open up the summer of your junior year. And so you can start getting promises of scholarship money even before you're a senior in high school for your college career. So if you always thought that you weren't right for college because it's so darn expensive, it is expensive. I paid my own way. Whoops. Sorry, that probably sounded really terrible. I paid my own way through college, so I know how expensive it is. But you can start laying the groundwork your junior year to have college paid for 
by starting to get several thousand dollars in scholarships for college before you're a high school senior. Isn't that cool? I think it's pretty neat. Next up, excuse me, so senior year. Take your SATs. Do it twice. You're allowed to take your SATs more than once, but not more than twice, I think, your senior year. Take it twice. And what they do is they take the higher of the two scores. It's almost like my spelling tests, okay? So definitely, definitely, definitely take it twice. Your senior year in high school, take it twice. Your senior year in high school, um, uh, it, this is the time where you apply to different universities. Do the tours. Different universities offer tours where you can actually go on a walking tour to see what the university is like. I highly suggest that you do the tours. Even if you're just going to stay in state and stay in Tucson, even go to the University of Arizona or go up to Phoenix and go to Arizona State University, yeah, uh, or, or Flagstaff, NAU, maybe don't, I don't know. I, I have a degree from NAU, but I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit divided about getting an undergrad there. Um, but do the university tours, do, do the tours, find out where you want to be if you go to school, okay? And then again, I would say again, talk to a military recruiter if that is the way you want to go. Now, um, and again, this is optional, okay? Um, yeah, definitely, 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 that is the thing, okay? Um, also... You know what, I should have talked about junior year. I should have said also take two or more classes for college credit. So in your junior year, in your, in your sophomore year, try to take at least one uh, weighted class. So some kind of class that is uh, uh, gonna be a more advanced class. In your junior year, take at least two or more classes that give you college credit, and then same thing senior year. Uh, try to take two or more classes for college credit. If you can do that, if you can pull that off, you're going to start college with a full semester, a whole half a year that you don't have to pay for. You're already, when you start college out of high school, you're going to be half a year ahead. You're going to have some scholarship money from all of the stuff that we've been talking about. Uh, you're going to know your options if you want to join the military and get the military to pay for your school. And so, guys, if you want to go to college, there are so many different things that you can do to prepare and get ready for it that if you want to go to college and you are following these steps to prepare, I would almost say that there's no reason for you not to. Just because fortune favors the prepared, and even if you are broke living out of your parents car okay you can still go to college if you follow these steps and find the right resources okay especially if you're poor there are special scholarships set up to help you especially if you're poor and if you're a first generation kid then meaning your parents never went to college there are all kinds of assistance programs out there to help you all right um let's see i'm almost done don't worry um, so talk to a military recruiter if going to the military, consider college first. And we already talked about why, again, you know, you become an officer, you make a whole lot more money, you have a college degree when you're done. Again, this is totally optional, okay? If not going to college in military, Make sure you can choose your posting assignment. So if you're doing the military and whatnot, you want to make sure that you're in the correct branch. You know, if if you want to be if you want to be on a um, uh, uh, if you want to be working with airplanes, maybe don't join the Marines. Join the Air Force. Okay. If you want to be on a ship out at sea, don't join the Army, join the Navy, okay? Join the branch of the service that you think is the best fit for you. Make sure that, that you don't take no for an answer and try to get the posting that you want. If you want to live on land somewhere, you know, get a posting in Alabama or in Texas, 
if you really want to live on the coasts, maybe you can be in a military base in Virginia or, or California or something like that. Okay. So try to get the posting that you want. Okay. All right. Um, did we already say, yeah, apply to different universities, do the tours. So here in your senior year, weigh the different scholarship offers and different acceptance offers to universities. Okay, so they're going to give you all kinds of different options. All right, different universities are going to say yes, and some are going to say no. And some are going to say yes, but they don't offer you any financial aid. They don't give you any scholarship money. Other universities might say yes, and we'll pay for everything. And in fact, University of Arizona and Arizona State University, they do that a lot because they want to keep the real smart kids in Arizona. All right. And so weigh the different options and make a choice. Enroll. Next thing, and I know some of you maybe won't like this, do not take a gap year. So a gap year, if you've never heard of a gap year, a gap year is a year that a lot of high school seniors take off before they go into college. I suggest you do not take a gap year. I know that people do take gap years and they're fine, but I have never personally had a good friend take off a take a gap year and then do really great when they get back into school. If anything, don't take a gap year go to the university of your choice or the college of your choice and study abroad if you study abroad it's better than taking a gap year because one when you go to a foreign country that's interesting and fun you immediately have a group of people around you that are in your class that are your friends and the school looks after you so you're not marooned somewhere and i've been marooned places it's not fun being an American in a foreign country who doesn't speak the language and being stuck when you're only 19 years old, right? That's not cool. I've been there, okay? So, so if you really want to do something that's a little more relaxing, don't take the gap year. Go directly into college and do study abroad. Uh, again, you have supports that you wouldn't have there. There's financial assistance that you wouldn't have if you did a gap year. And you're still on the right track for the rest of your life. And you can study abroad multiple places. You can go to China for one semester. You can go to Italy for another semester. Um, it just depends on the university that you go to and what they offer. So don't take a gap year. Jump straight into it. All right. Um, let's see here. And last thing I would encourage you to do is apply for all the scholarships you can. So kids, I use this example, and this is a true story. You are looking at uh, the recipient of the Arizona State University Jewish Women's Scholarship when I was a sophomore or junior at ASU. Kids, I am not Jewish, and I am not a woman, and yet I still want the Jewish Women's Scholarship <clears throat> because most scholarships, even if they say, you know, like African-American uh, uh, ballet dancers or whatever, right? If you read the fine print, you don't actually have to be African-American or a ballet dancer. Most of these scholarships will let you apply, even if you're not the person that, that, that is the scholarship is named for. If you can convince them to give you the money, they'll give you the money if they think you're a good person worthy of this, of this gift, okay? So kids, your senior year in high school, as you're making your plans, apply for everything you can, okay? <coughs> now kids, if you follow these steps, this will open the doors for you to go to any uh, any of the choices that you want, whether it's going into a trade school, because if you do all these steps, any trade school will take you, I promise, okay? Uh, but yeah, going into a trade school, going into a military career, or uh, a university is all on the table for you if you do these things. Okay, anyway, that's a long, long talk. I'm done. Um, the reason why I'm hesitant is because these economics and current events lessons are really kind of like mixing in with like the life skills lessons here.
right? And so they're all kind of merging into one. Like in life skills, I'm talking about keeping your options open. And in economics here, I'm talking to you about some options. And so um, uh, uh, some of you might be thinking, well, Mr. Roll, you're talking about stuff that is definitely not part of a normal middle school curriculum and is definitely uh, not something that you're going to quiz us on because we're not doing any homework anymore. Why are you, why are you talking at us like this? What, what's, what's the deal? So the deal is that, um, like I always say, our, our time is really precious, and I only have uh, a, literally a few more days that you have, I have any reasonable expectation of you listening to anything I say. And so I, I want to try to give you just a little bit of guidance for a few of you. And if, if even there's only one or two of you out there who are listening to this and can take something away from this, uh, th that'll, be, that'll be enough for me. Uh, so uh, the reason why we're talking about supply chains is I want you to understand a little bit about how the world works and how this can benefit you. All right, so um, specifically, I want to talk about, um, I want to talk about jobs. And so in life, uh, again, this feels a little bit more like a life skill, even though this is supposedly economics, right? Um, in life, there's generally two kinds of adults. Um, and so, so there are job creators. We have job creators, and then we have job takers. And uh, one is not good and one is bad. One is not better than the other. Uh, job creators and job takers are both very important. They make the world go round. And so, like you might imagine, a job creator creates the job. A job taker fills the job. And so without the job taker, the job creator would be useless. And without the job creator, the job taker would not have a job. And so a job taker is typically someone um, just just... Most of the people that you know in life are job takers. Um, so um, even, even very important people that we respect, yeah? So someone like a doctor, most doctors are job takers. Uh, someone that we respect, like, you know, a nurse is a job taker. A teacher is a job taker, yeah? Um, hopefully you respect teachers. Um, a police officer, someone that we should respect, right? Whoops. Police officer, ah. What happened to my pen? Pen, come back. Pen, come back. You can blame it all on me. I was wrong, and no one wants to hear my karaoke. Okay. Ah, it's doing this again. I hate it when it does this. All right. Give me a second, guys. I'm probably going to edit this. There we go. Okay. All right. Back on track. So doctors and teachers are typically mostly job takers, okay? Uh, someone like a uh, restaurant worker, okay? Uh, I'll call them like a server. Most servers are job takers. Cooks are job takers. You know, so most things that you could list, things that you might be aspiring to one day, they're job takers. And so job creators are people, uh, um, people that, that start things. Um, entrepreneurs are job creators, um, people who start their own small businesses. Um, so entrepreneur is a big word for business starter. And I want to make sure I can keep as many of you as I can in this conversation. So I'll just say business starters. So someone who starts a business is a job creator. Um, uh, research scientists that run their own labs, they're called PIs for principal investigators. Principal investigators. Principal investigators are job creators. Okay? And so, so on the one side, most people in your life are job takers. But we also have these job creators. And so... Um, as we get ready to part ways, I want you to understand that in your future, you can be either one, whatever suits you the best, whether you enjoy being a job taker, where you like to have a predefined job and you know I'm supposed to come in and do this, this, and this, and that makes me comfortable, um, and, and a lot of people are like that. My wife is like that. My wife is a job taker and she is a scientist. And she performs at a very high level. I'm very proud of my wife. 
but she's a job taker and that's what suits her and that's what she likes to do and that's great um, but if you want to be a job creator okay if you want to create value and create jobs that didn't exist before um, there's a few different kinds of job creators and so we're gonna focus again on these business starters or entrepreneurs okay so again when you hear that term entrepreneur an entrepreneur is nothing but a business starter and so when we talk about business starters usually as children as a child what you're usually thinking of is somebody who owns a shop a shop owner a shop owner and there's nothing wrong with being a shop owner that's uh, we need shop owners and shop owners are fantastic okay uh, and so most shop owners do retail some shop owners do repair and service Um, and so retail is a lot of different things. So retail can be like you own a clothing shop or uh, you own a grocery uh, store or a liquor store or um, I don't know, whatever kind of business where you're selling products and, and, and things that people come in and buy. That's a retail store. Um, now that everything's going online these days, maybe you own, maybe you make t-shirts or something like that online and people buy your clothes. Maybe maybe you do those kinds of things like you're you're an owner of a retail establishment or a repair service those are shop owners um, but then on on the other hand we have we have basic shop owners and they can be small like like a like like a small convenience store down the street or they can be big like a target or a best buy those are shops and so uh, you know whether it's big or small uh, being a shop owner is 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 creating these kinds of jobs but then we also have uh, what we can call makers or creators makers or creators and if you're a maker or a creator that's different than being a shop owner because you are actually manufacturing something people who manufacture something manufacture I'm not spelling correctly manufacture a product or create a service Wow Mr. Roll you're really running deep down this rabbit hole yeah I am so kids you don't have to be a job taker if you don't want to if you really don't like being told what to do and you think that you can make good decisions and you want to be the person who runs a company or or your own small business you can be that person and again we have two basic kinds of small businesses in general that you can run now there's many others but these are the two big ones and so again these shop owners these are the ones that you hear about when you're a child okay uh, and, and it doesn't mean that these are childish. There's nothing childish about running your own beauty salon. There's nothing childish about running your own, um, I don't know, your own, your own computer shop or whatever it is that you like to sell. Um, you know, uh, uh, oh, oh, you know, food establishments also fall under this. If you have a food establishment, there's nothing childish about running your own restaurant or your own bakery that's good stuff and people love that now if you're a maker or creator and you're doing something totally new or different though that's also an option to you and so people who are makers and creators they make something totally new And you know about people who are makers and creators um, because you see on Instagram, well, if you're on Instagram, or uh, even on uh, TikTok, uh, there are people who own their own clothing brands or who manufacture their own stuff. Um, this year, I showed you guys one of my old friends, the wealthy guy, uh, uh, Robert Pauley Jr. III, my friend who lives in New York. He is a... 
uh, he is a creator. He creates his own line of clothing. And so people who own their own brands and their own fashion, they are making something totally new. Uh, but, but these kinds of people need to understand a few things. So they need to understand, they need to understand design. You probably knew that already. People like the wealthy guy, my friend, need to be able to design their products. They need to understand marketing. And again, you probably had thought of that already as well. Because you see people like, uh, like, like Kylie Jenner or Kim Kardashian, and you know that they make their own stuff and they have to get that word out there. And really, the way that they're so successful is people like them and their brand. But if you make something totally new, you need to have that design sense, you need to know marketing, and then finally, tying it back to our discussion, if you are the one making this something totally new, you need to understand supply chain management. So kids, being able to get the things that you need to make your stuff that's totally new, that's a skill and not everybody has it, and not everybody even knows that it's a thing. I was working with a, um, I was working with an agricultural business down in Mexico a number of years ago, and this agricultural business, believe it or not, they were known for watermelons and other kinds of cantaloupe and, and uh, uh, honeydew, so they were known for uh, melons and other seasonal fruits and vegetables. That was their product. They were a maker and creator because they were a factory farm and they did most of their uh, farming indoors. They actually had these giant greenhouses in Mexico and they had served a local market in Mexico, but they wanted to expand into the United States and start producing at a much larger scale. And so I was one of the consultants that came in to help them. And this was a big thing that they didn't understand. They had no idea about the supply chain that they would need to tap into to hit scale, okay? And so kids, being able to understand where to get different pieces of equipment and whatnot and how to put that all together can be the key to unlocking your success one day. And so kids, it's one of those things where um, little boys and girls want to grow up to be astronauts or doctors or firemen or women, right? because they know that that exists. They know that it's a thing that people do. And so I'm telling you this right now so that you know that this is a thing people do. Supply chain management is a skill that you will need if you wanna be a creator one day. And it's also a career path if you wanna be a job taker but help someone else who's a creator figure this out. And so part of my job when I was brought on by this company was to help them with supply chain management. I helped them get cardboard from another company in southern Mexico and Guatemala. I helped them get um, I helped them get RFID tags, which is a radio frequency ID tag. I helped them buy them in bulk from Asia, and so we set up these different suppliers from different parts of the world to deliver products. And uh, we created a warehouse and we created an inventory system. And, and we just built up all of these different things that they needed to hit this at scale. And then they needed to, uh, 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 we, we had to contract them with a shipping company that knew how to get in and out of the United States. Um, uh, you know, because there's all sorts of different laws when you're importing uh, produce, uh, health codes, and things like that. Um, and I didn't know all the answers, but I knew who to call. And so if you want to be a creator one day, doesn't matter what you want to do, whether you want to be a farmer, uh, whether you want to create new technology products, like maybe you want to be the next Steve Jobs or Bill Gates, you need to understand this piece of supply chain management and how that works for you. And again, if you think, if you think that, this, that there's excitement here, that you think you might like to be that guy or that girl that connects different companies together to make things work. You can actually do that for a job. And again, supply chain management is, is just called, uh, the people who do that are supply chain managers. 
And kids, supply chain manager is a super cool job. These people get to travel sometimes all over the world for free because the company's paying them to go to factories and shake people's hands and make deals and figure out how to get in and out of ports or how to uh, negotiate with a railroad company. Like these people are necessary today and we do not have enough supply chain managers in the United States. And so if you love to travel, if you wanna make money one day and you think you're good at talking to people, you don't have to be the best at math and, and uh, you just have to be somebody who's willing to learn on the fly and you have to be able to get a college degree in this. Uh, this can be a job for you one day. If you want to be a creator, again, and make something totally new with your company, you need to at least have a basic idea that this exists. And, and, and you need to take that into account when you're making your plans for the future. Okay, so maybe that made some sense for some of you. Again, I apologize for those of you who didn't. But I hope for some of you who are trying to figure out what direction you want to take your life in when you get into high school and afterwards, maybe what you want to do for a job. I know a lot of you have told me, hey, I'm thinking about uh, becoming a marine biologist or I'm thinking about doing engineering one day. I know a couple of you have told me that you want to become chefs and that's very cool. I want to present a few more ideas to you and talk to you about what it is to be a job creator uh, before you leave my class. All right, thanks for listening. I'll, I'll see you guys in history here. Oh, wrong button. <laughs> Hey everybody, I was going to make you do the practice today on Khan Academy for history, but I posted these lessons too late and I want to give you enough time to catch up like we talked about in the introduction. So no history for today. Today history is going to be on break. All right, let's go ahead and jump over to uh, literature. All right, today we're talking about the last chapter that you were supposed to read, chapter 30. And so this chapter really helps heighten some of the tension. And um, it, it's kind of like at that TV show where the episode ends on a cliffhanger. So this one kind of ends on that cliffhanger. So uh, the next morning, Huck comes back and he goes back to the Welshman and he learns that uh, the, the, the two guys from the night before ran away. And so the Welshman saved uh, uh, Widow uh, McDougall's life because of him. And so he's the big hero. And so throughout the course of their conversation, Huck eventually has to tell him that uh, one of the guys is Evil Joe that, that murdered the doctor at the beginning of the book. And, uh, and so the Welshman's, whoa, you know. Uh, and so the Welshman tells everybody what happened, but he leaves Huckleberry Finn's identity, the identity of the hero, anonymous, uh, uh, so that they can, they can have a big surprise. Um, but the surprise is kind of ruined because Huckleberry Finn gets sick, probably from being out all the time, uh, you know, chasing down Evil Joe, right? Uh, and so um, in this chapter, we find out that, um, that, that on Sunday, the, you know, when everybody's getting ready to go to church, uh, Becky and Tom are not there. They're, 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 they're not to be found. And so uh, Aunt, uh, Aunt, 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 uh, Aunt Polly and uh, Becky's mom uh, and they, they both check in with the woman who they were supposed to, uh, uh, who Becky was supposed to stay with. They didn't show up. They, they didn't make it to, to Miss McDougall's house or the, the widow McDougall's house like they were, they were planning on. And so everybody immediately forms a search party and figures that they're still in the cave. And so the search party looks to the cave and they find uh, like Becky and Tom written on the wall uh, in soot. And they find a ribbon from Becky, but that's about it. And then um, the, the widow, McDougal, is taking care of Huck uh, with, his, with his fever as he's feeling sick. And she doesn't know yet that he's her savior, that he saved her life the other night. You know, but she's a good woman and she's still taking care of him. And the chapter ends and we don't know where Becky and Tom are. So you don't have any homework because it's uh, the last day uh, and, and I'm posting these lessons late. Like, you know, <clears throat> and so next week... Uh, we're going to be reading the last of this together uh, so that we can finish out the book together. So I'll actually be reading it with you uh, here. Okay. All right. Let's go ahead and uh, jump over to science.
All right, it's time for science. As Riley would say, all right, my dudes, it's time. And dudettes, you know, because you don't want to. Anyway, um, so for science, folks, there's nothing new. Um, we already talked about basic or simple machines and all of that fun stuff. I just want to remind you that we gave you some questions yesterday. I was planning on giving you more questions today, but I'm not going to. Make sure that those questions from yesterday gets answered and get turned in. This is your final science grade for the year. So uh, please get that done, and this is simply a reminder. There's no new lesson or any new homework. And that's it. Let's go ahead and jump over to math. And today, math is going to be a combined lesson for groups one and two. Uh, and uh, let's go ahead and jump into that. All right, so I think we're recording. Yes, we're recording. Uh, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, we are going to be doing combined math group one and group two. So if you're joining us, like we have a couple of you fifth graders, we're, we see you there, girls, you know, <laughs> I know you're still watching. Um, uh, so if you are in one of my other classes or even like in sixth grade and you're not normally watching this video, groups one and groups two will be combined for a couple days. Uh, uh, as we go through things. So group number one, you had four combination questions that uh, you were supposed to do yesterday. As promised, because these lessons are posted a little bit late, I'm not giving you any new homework. Just make sure that you get those four questions done and turned into Mr. Barbero. That is your final math grade for the year. Uh, group number two, you had exponents challenge on Khan Academy, and that's uh, your final uh, math grade for the year. And so today, we're going to introduce or reintroduce, for those of you who've had this before, the idea of scientific notation. Scientific notation. And so scientific notation is an easy way, and it really is easy, it's uh, an easy way to write numbers It's an easy way to write numbers that are super big or super small. So we have numbers that are super big, numbers that are super small, and sometimes it becomes irritating just having to write them. All right, so um, let me give you an example. So in economics, we brought back the number for US GDP. So for the United States gross domestic product, and for those of you who are not in my economics group, gross domestic product is the total value of everything the United States produces in a year. So if you sat down and you took a calculator and you added up every single, the value of every single service, like uh, services being like a maid's cleaning service, or a tax service that does your taxes, or um, like even even this school. Like right now, what I'm giving to you is technically a service, although you probably think it's torture, but that's another thing. Okay, if you added up a value of all the, the services in the United States in a year, and you added up the value of all the products that were sold, every car that was sold, every toy that was sold, every video game that was sold, every song that you streamed on Spotify, okay? If you, if you took the value of all of those things, that would be your gross domestic product for the year. And so in the United States, our, our, our annual gross domestic product is something around $17 trillion. Now, it's not exactly $17 trillion, but it's kind of like close to that. Um, uh, I think it was, a, didn't we say the European Union before it was like 21 or 22 trillion, something like that. Anyway, uh, so 17 trillion is the number that's on the top of my head right now. So we're just going to go with that number, um, even though that might be a year or two old. Okay, so when we write it out, trillion is a really big number. And so if we have this as 17,000, that's 17 million, that's 17 billion, and now that's 17 trillion. So that is one, two, three, four sets of three zeros. That's 12 zeros. That's a, a one and a seven with 12 zeros after it. That's a big boat load of numbers. That's a lot of numbers, a lot of zeros, in fact. Um, so for scientific notation, what we do is we take one digit, and then we put a decimal point, and then any more digits. 
And these are non-zero digits. Non, that's none. I don't mean none, I mean non. Non-zero, and I'll say non-zero numbers. So these are all non-zero numbers. So we take our first non-zero number, which is right here. This is our first non-zero number. I'll put a first right here. We put our first non-zero number, and then however many more non-zero numbers we put behind it. We don't put zeros in, we only put non-zero numbers unless, and, and there, there, there's a weird unless to this, but I'm not going to get to that just yet, okay? And then we take whatever this is, and then we multiply it times 10 to the somethingth power, and that's scientific notation. Now, you might be like, what? Wait, I don't get it. That's okay. It's okay not to get it right now. That was a pretty crummy explanation, okay? So let's go ahead and let's use this general framework and let's talk about that number 17 trillion. <clears throat> Excuse me. 17 million, billion, and trillion. So if I have 17 trillion of something, I have to take the first non-zero number, and that would be the one right here. Let me change my colors. There we go. So that one is my first non-zero number. So I'd have the one right here. And then my second non-zero number is the seven right there. And so I put my seven, okay, right there. And I put a decimal point between them just like that. And then what I have to do is I have to take it times 10 to the somethingth power. How do I figure out what that something is? Well, what I need to do is I take my normal number and I see where the decimal is right here. Do you see that? So normally my decimal is right there at the end of the zero, but it's understood. We don't have to write it because it's an understood decimal. And what I have to do is I have to bump this understood decimal all the way up until it gets to between the one and the seven. So you see there's a decimal point between the one and the seven. And so I have to count how many spaces I bump the decimal over till I get there. So I go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. I had to bump my decimal thirteen times to get it there, so it's 1.7 times 10 to the thirteenth power. Now to write it out in a way that's maybe not as sloppy, 17 trillion, 17 million, billion, trillion, 17 trillion is equal to 1.7 times 10 to the 13th power. This number and this number are the same. Now, you might be asking yourself, wait a second, okay, so this is the standard way that we write it, okay? If I'm playing the lottery and that's what I'm looking to win, that's the way you'd write it. And this is the scientific notation. And scientific notation is abbreviated psi note, like that. So you might be saying, Mr. Roll, why? Why would you do that? It just seems like a lot of work for nothing. Well, you know how I'm always having to count how many zeros I have here? That can get really old. Let's say that you're doing a report on American GDP and Chinese GDP, because China's a really big country. They have really big GDP. It's going to get really old really fast trying to keep track of all of your numbers. And there's just too many zeros. It's really hard to keep track of. But it's easier to keep track of the number 13. And so you can say, well, it's 1.7 times 10 to the 13th power. And um, let me just take, I'm, I'm going to take it like a wild guess. I don't know if this is true or not um, because I'm just maybe guessing here. But this is US GDP, right? And then if you, if you took a number like China's GDP, which I think is something like 8 times 10 to the 13th, 12th, is it 11th power? 10, 8, 10, 8, okay, 3, 6, 9, 12. Yeah, times 10 to the 12th power, okay. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. And this is Chinese GDP, China GDP. Suddenly, these numbers start to make more sense. Um, uh, let me let me make up some more numbers here. Uh, whoops, go away. Okay, wait. Oh, is my pen doing that weird thing? I hate it when it does this. Okay, all right. So I have that. Uh, let's say uh, twenty 
1, 2.1 times 10 to the 13th power. That would be the European Union GDP. And so all of a sudden, when you, when you start comparing these large numbers, scientific notation begins to look a little bit easier because these numbers are just so huge, it's really hard to keep track of all these zeros. It's a lot easier to say, oh, well, the United States is times 10 to the 13th power, the European Union is times 10 to the 13th power, and therefore this number and this number, they're very, very close. All right? And this number is times 10 to the 12th power, so it's a whole zero away, so it's a whole 10 times lower or lesser than these other numbers. Um, and so suddenly, uh, scientific notation begins to make a little bit more sense. All right, let's go ahead and do a different one. Um, <clears throat> now, scientific notation can run backwards, too. I'm just going to show it in the backwards way, and then I'm going to let it rest, and we're going to pick it up next week on week 10, day one. All right? Uh, so let's say something's really, really small. Um, let's, talk about, let's talk about viruses, because everyone's talking about coronavirus. And so uh, let's say, let's talk about meters. Um, so, uh, computer. Is the computer on? Computer, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Oh, I'm here. Like computer, how many microns are in one millimeter? One millimeter is 1,000 micrometers. Oh, do you hear that? So, a micron. So if we have uh, a micron here, so 1,000 uh, microns, 1,000 microns equals one millimeter. Now, the reason why I bring this up, okay, is uh, so you could say that um, if there's a thousand, it's going to be 0 0.001 millimeters equals one micron. And so scientists, from, from a couple papers I've read, uh, some scientists are theorizing that the COVID-19 virus is about one micron wide, give or take. So the coronavirus would be about uh, 0 0.001 millimeters wide. And a millimeter, okay, um, a millimeter is a thousandth of a meter. So if you divide a meter into a thousand, okay, and so to do that, uh, let's say let's say we don't want to measure it in millimeters, we want to measure it in meters. Oh, I did it again. Go away. Don't do that. Okay. So we have zero point zero 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 one meters equals one micron. So in science, we measure everything in meters. And so suddenly, when we start to measure things that are very small using meters, you might be able to say, wait a second, this looks like it's going to start getting really hard if we're measuring things in meters when they're only a micron or maybe a fraction of a micron wide. If we have to measure in meters, it's just not going to work until you bring in scientific notation. 0 0.000001 meters also is the same as 1 times 10 to the negative 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 to the negative 6th. So did you see that this time I had to bump it that way? Because I was bumping it to the right rather than to the left, my 6 is negative. So scientific notation works both ways. When we're going that way, it's positive. When we're going that way, it's negative. And so here is scientific notation that's notating something that's very small rather than very large. Again, scientific notation, we call it scientific because when we're speaking of science things like the Artemis program, going to the moon, uh, uh, or if we're talking about the coronavirus being like super duper tiny, right? We talk about things that are very small and very big. And so we need an easy way to mathematically describe these things that are very small and very big that doesn't drive us totally bananas. And scientific notation is that anti-banana driving way of notating our numbers. All right, so I'm going to stop blathering on for now so that you can have a good weekend. Take care, be safe, have a wonderful weekend. 
I know a lot of us are getting out of quarantine now so we can go see extended family. I hope you guys are able to do that. All right, I wish you the best. See you later. Mm -hmm.